I was a drug user. Um, basically, when I fell away again, I became a drug dealer. And rather than just destroying my life and you know those closest to me, I ended up wrecking the lives of hundreds of people, if not thousands. I never had peace. Um, you know, I'd go on lovely holidays. I'd ha I had a nice uh, little sports car thing, and and you know, everything you could kind of want from a materialistic point of view. And yet, I was. I was frustrated, uh, angry, and unfulfilled. I, unfulf like the sense of unfulfillment I had was all-encompassing, really, because I I knew what I'd had and lost, and um, and yet I was pursuing this life of darkness. Yeah, hi, my name's Callum. Uh, I'm from a little town uh, just outside of London. I'm here today on God's Heart TV, basically to share my testimony. It's, it's, a, it's a whole life test to me really, so I'm going to try and condense it as much as I can. But uh, when I was about five, mum mum and dad's house was due for repossession. And uh, it was to the point where bailiffs were you know, going to actually take possession of the property. And uh, you know, mum sort of fell to her knees and said, look, if there's a God, uh, please help us in this situation. And, and this was, I mean, in the, early, in the late 80s. Uh, and basically there wasn't like the, the computer systems and stuff there are now. And what transpired was that somehow uh, they managed to sa save the house from repossession. Um, and from that point, you know, mum started following, following God and she, she'd had uh, a pretty rough uh, childhood and pretty rough life. And, you know, as she started pressing into God, um, lots, of, lots of amazing things started to happen in her life. Um, dad wasn't quite as receptive. So we grew up in a, in a, in a family that was... Um, quite polarised, so we had one parent who, who was really on fire for God and then the other who wasn't. And we were sort of caught in the middle a little with that. Um, I remember as a child really being, I, I really loved Jesus. I was, it was on the coattails of my mum's faith, I feel, but it was, it was no less real. Um, I remember like, I must have been six or seven, I was like praying for other kids in the school and things. and. Uh, you know, trying to like baptise them in the Holy Spirit and stuff. Not that I really knew, obviously, what that was per se. But um, so I had a genuine, <clears throat> a genuine interest and a passion for, uh, you know, for, for, for Jesus at that point. Um, but as I started to get older, um, the environment I was in, in terms of the church and things like that, and I'm not, I'm not knocking the church I was in, but all I saw really as a as a kid was some like kind of dusty old people, not hymns and hard pews and, and uh, there wasn't really a lot of life and you know I was hearing these things in the Bible and I wasn't really seeing it played out <clears throat> you know in, in real life. So as I started to get older I remember you know me and my brother would do things like we hid in a, I hid in a cupboard for like eight hours uh, one day just to avoid church and we, we popped out feeling quite proud of ourselves and uh, it turned out it was a Saturday so we'd, uh, we'd spent the whole the whole day in a cupboard trying to miss church and uh, it, it was the wrong day. <laughs> so things like that, um, you know, I was, I was in church most of my sort of childhood and then um, <clears throat> I, I, I sort of started to hit my teens um, and uh, yeah, I lived in a little village at the time and uh, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot to be said for boredom. People often think that if, you, if you're in a life of drugs or crime, uh, you must have like some dysfunction or, or you've come from a family that was broken and things like that. And that's actually not necessarily the case. Um, it certainly wasn't with me. I had quite a good childhood, to be fair. Um, we didn't have much, but you know, it was, it was a, happy, a happy time. But there just wasn't much to do. Um, and so what we found ourselves doing really was kind of making our own entertainment. And uh, <laughs> that sort of involved, it started to involve like petty crime and things like that. Um, we would go into the fields near our, our, behind our houses and we'd like break into people's sheds basically and see like who could get the best thing. Um, so it started like that and then I ended up watching, uh, I think it was, it was, a, it was a feel, I think it was something like Gone in 60 Seconds where, they're, where they're, they have this like crew and they put this crew together and they're trying to like do this heist and I sort of got it in my head that we would do something like that and so me and my friends got together and we like devised this plan to, uh, to, to basically burgle a house, um, which I was 13 or 14 at the time, so it, it boggles my mind to think that you know, I've got a son who's, who's nearly 10. And uh, you know, I was concocting these, these plans at, at such a young age. Um, 
from really no negative influence I can really think of, and uh, other than the films and stuff, I guess. So there is a lot to be said about what we watch. Um, so yeah, so at the age of, I, I think I was 14, going on 15, and my brother was 13, we actually burgled a house in our village. Um, and uh, you know, we took uh, like DVDs and, and uh, some alcohol and things like that. And um, that sort of started a, a, a downward uh, spiral really for, because it was fun, you know. Um, we didn't really see the damage you know, that, that this lifestyle was already beginning to cause people. It, it was just like a kind of instant gratification thing, something to do because, you know, we didn't have anything else to do. I never really struggled at school. Um, you know, I remember, um, you know, all my, all my sort of peer group was really stressing about the GCSEs and I never revised and I got A's and B's um, and, and then didn't really know what to do. And I kind of fell into the sick form um, just because I hadn't really had any, I hadn't really made any plans. Um, but at this point, uh, in my sort of life outside of school, I had started to, the old cliche, you know, I started to sort of mix with the wrong people. Um, and again, there is a lot to be said, you know, if there's any parents watching this, I would encourage you to, without being overbearing, watch and, and be aware of who your children are hanging around with, even online and stuff now as well, which, which wasn't really a thing, you know, when I was growing up. So I started to, again, because I was after excitement, um, and, and something to stave off the boredom. Um, basically, I started dabbling, uh, smoking weed, cannabis and that. Um, and, you know, it is definitely true what they say about it being a gateway drug, you know. In my own experience, um, <clears throat> once I'd started smoking, um, it was very easy for me to then be introduced to some of the other drugs, uh, some of the rave drugs and, and uh, cocaine and whatnot. Um, so, about 14, 15, started smoking weed. Um, and then <clears throat> around that lifestyle, I was hanging out on a certain estate in the town that I was at. And uh, there was a, a one particular guy, um, I, won't, I won't mention his name, but he, he was probably the, pro he was the main negative influence in my life at that time. And uh, ironically, <clears throat> I actually knew him from previously because we used to go to the same church together as kids. And he'd obviously totally gone off the rails and so had I. And then we you know, met up again, which may or may not have been a coincidence, you know, because the devil does have schemes, you know, that he wants to, you know, use against us to, to try and get us off our path. Um, so met up with this guy and aside from the, the drugs, he introduced me into like stealing cars and things like that. So we'd do that, we'd steal cars uh, a couple of week probably for a little while and then we'd, we'd joyride and then um, end up, you know, uh, just putting them in a field and setting them on fire to kind of, um, you know, do away with any of the evidence of fingerprints and things. Um, and we thought this was hugely entertaining. Again, not really uh, thinking about the, the cost to other people. And actually, just to emphasise that point, um, we, we were in a village and there was a party going on and uh, we decided we were going to rob a car. And there was a, a particularly old car, one of the Rover Metros next door. And... Uh, so we stole this car and there was loads of um, pieces of like uh, bodywork and stuff in the back. So we just threw them in a hedge and, uh, and you know, did what we did. And I think we, we crashed into a wall, set, set it on fire and really thought nothing more of it. Um, <clears throat> and a few days later, because it was the next door neighbour to the party we were at, we sort of heard the backstory. And, and uh, it was actually, I think it was a 17 year old lad's car and he'd saved up all this money to get this vehicle <coughs> and uh, you know, um, he'd, he'd bought the body parts to do it up and stuff. And you know, in, in, in one evening, in an hour, we totally destroyed that for him. And uh, you know, apparently he, he burst into tears when he found out it was stolen, so I hear. And uh, you know, now, I have a, <laughs> now I have a conscience and a conviction over those things. Um, I don't feel condemned, but there is a conviction to the things that I've done. Um, whereas before, my heart was so callous. Like I actually think I laughed about it um, at that point, and it, you know, I um, I really didn't care about anyone but myself. Actually, some of the some of the photos here. Um, so that's me, uh, and this is some of my friends, my brothers back there as well. Um, basically, yeah, we're just like smoking up, uh, and so that's how we were sort of knocking about. Um, and at this at this point. <laughs> this is how I looked 
<laughs> which is quite different to how I look now, thank God for that. I often say that uh, the first miracle Jesus ever performed was getting rid of that haircut. Um, it looks like a helmet or something, man. But uh, yeah, that's how I was knocking about for a little while. So dad was working away a lot. Uh, he, he's an engineer, so he was working in, in Belgium um, for, mo for the majority of all this going on. But mum was aware. I, bizarrely, I was, always, I was always pretty open and honest with mum about it. Um, I, I never really hid much from her, and to be honest with you, she was pretty on the ball. She, she knew what was going on. I remember the watershed when I sort of felt like I'd come out from underneath my parents' discipline, as it were. Um, we were in the village, and uh, some of my pals were down the, down, the, down the way, and they asked me to come out, because uh, they, they had some weed and that, and uh, mum was like, you are not going out, categorically, you're not going out. Shuts me in my, in my bedroom, which is like the first story of the house, and I jump out my first story window, <laughs> run off down a, down, the, down a park and that. And uh, I, that, again, was another watershed where I basically decided that I wasn't going to actually listen to my parents anymore. You know, and I thank God, man, thank God that mum didn't, you know, wash her hands of me and, and, and uh, you know, just kick me out. Like so many of my friends, because I've got, I mean, I can't even number them on two hands. You know, the, 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 the friends I had who's, who were knocking about and doing the same kind of things I was, and their parents just had enough of them and said, you know, get out. Um, some of them are some of them aren't even here anymore. Uh, some of them are, are, are homeless people. Um, you know, in the in the local town, um, drug addicts and stuff like that. A few of them ob obviously sorted themselves out, but yeah, you know, the vast majority suffered extremely because their parents basically said enough's enough. And uh, yeah, you know, so I owe mum a lot actually. Um, and actually, I would say, you know, if there's any praying mothers here, or if there's any. If there's any parents whose children are wayward at the minute, don't stop praying. Uh, mum used to drive around the, the estate where I was knocking about on two, three, four in the morning, knowing I was out there somewhere, praying, praying, praying. And I mean, this went on for like five years. It, it wasn't like an overnight thing. It wasn't a couple of weeks of madness. This was a lifestyle I was in. Fast forward, so we're doing all this stuff with robbing the cars. Obviously, mum's just praying. She's ringing up everyone asking for prayer for me. I don't care. I'm not interested. I think I'm having a great time. Uh, I got introduced to pills, ecstasy, and uh, and cocaine. We couldn't. The, the age we were, we were like 16. We didn't have a lot of money, so <coughs> we we predominantly used to uh, yeah go to raves and things like that. Um, take pills. It was it was cheaper. So I'm about probably about 13 and a half stone now, about eight, 85 kilos. At that point, I was seven and a half stone. Um, I don't even know what that is in kilos. What like 50 kilos or something. Um, so I just I obviously wasn't eating, I was taking amphetamines and stuff all the time. So um, <clears throat> it was pretty, pretty bad, but I didn't actually think it was. Um, but obviously, if you were to look externally at my life at that particular point, it was really bad. Um, but I just had this screen up, really, and I just thought it was a bit of a laugh. So there's an, there's an element of, there's an element of uh, enjoyment in this. You know, the devil, the devil will... You know, he'll never just show you the fish hook. He, he puts a bit of bait on the fish hook. And then once you've eaten the bait, obviously you're hooked. So, um, and that can be with anything, with, with drugs or alcohol or, you know, uh, power, pornography. And, you know, anything that appears to be good or enjoyable always has a caveat. Um, you know, the devil will never give you anything without taking something else. Um, you know, and I've just, I've found that time and time again from experience. And uh, I think that would be the reason why I didn't actually see it for what it was at that particular point, because I was, there was elements of, it, of enjoyment, you know, and when you're at parties and when you're at raves and things like that, and you're with all your friends, obviously that's enjoyable, but it was in the, it was when my world was quiet uh, that it was, yeah, I didn't want to think too much. So I'd end up going out again. As with everything in the world um, and everything that the devil offers you, uh, it's always the law of diminishing returns. So basically what will happen is, you know, you'll do X and that will be great for a time, but then you have to do a little more and a little more and a little more. And that's with anything. Um, and, and until you find yourself, you know, like some of my friends now who are heroin addicts or, or you know, uh, their lives are totally blown apart and they just start smoking weed, you know, at the skate park or whatever. And now, now their lives are totally destroyed by drugs. And it was a slow, gradual process. I started to get like quite bad, what, what called come downs. I started to get like quite bad come downs off the, off the pills and that. So it would be like, I'd, ha I'd have a great night and then the next day would just be like, 
just felt like the world was falling on my head. Um, you couldn't find anything enjoyable about anything. The cons started to outweigh the pros, and I started to realise, hang on a minute, yeah, I was in quite an aggressive environment, you know, with the whole drug scene and stuff like that. And so I kind of, because I was small um, and skinny, I started to realise that actually, like, I was at a disadvantage in some of these more sort of aggressive environments. I started to kind of realise that I didn't really want to be in the drugs lifestyle like that anymore. Um, so I started trying to get fit. And actually what happened was I saw an army promotion or something, an army video on, online, I think it was. And uh, so I sort of decided that I wanted to go to join the army. So I went down to Purbright to do the uh, sort of like the, the recruit tests. And um, this is kind of where I feel like God stepped in. Um, it didn't feel like it at the time. I'd pulled myself away from the drug scene. I'd started running, I'd started training. I'd put on some weight, um, all for the focus of getting in the military. Um, <clears throat> so when I went down to the medical test, they basically found that I had a heart murmur. And uh, they said, look, you're gonna have to go and have an echocardiogram in London. Um, and, uh, and basically, you know, we'll have to go from there because it may render you ineligible for military service. So obviously I was gutted. I, I think actually at that point I'd, even tried to stop myself smoking. I was smoking like 20, 20, 25 cigarettes a day at this point. I didn't have a job at this point. Um, I'd thrown myself out of sick form. I think I was the only person in the school to ever be expelled from the sick form. Because uh, I, I um, in, in typical fashion at the time, I, I got some fireworks and I set them off over the school for some reason. Um, and uh, so they, they found out about that and I obviously got, uh, got expelled for that. So. Basically, I had to, uh, had to go and have an echocardiogram and they found what it was called a mitral valve regurgitation. So basically, one of the valves in my heart was letting blood back into the chamber. And I got a letter through from the military saying, basically, you're, you're rendered ineligible for military service for five years. So my whole construct that I'd thought, you know, I, I hadn't been changed. Jesus hadn't stepped in and changed anything. I was just doing this purely from self-will. So I'd tried to stop smoking, I'd stopped the drugs and was training and things. And then obviously when I got that letter, I was like, what does it matter then? Let's just go back and just do what I was doing before. Um, and at this point, uh, mum had, mum had bit, obviously she's in the background doing her thing, bless her. And uh, in 2002, she'd been to Skoan. She'd been to the synagogue in, in Nigeria and seen some crazy, crazy stuff happen out there. And, and basically she said to me, this was early 2007. She said, why don't you go out to this place and, uh, and get healing and obviously I didn't believe a word of it and I, I really thought it was a load of nonsense and I, I was like nah now nah, you're right thanks I think I'll be okay and she said well look me and your dad will pay for it why don't you just go out and see what happens and I thought um you know what's what's the worst that can happen I'll get to go out and see another country and that and uh you know experience some stuff and I'll come back and I'll just see what see what happens It all got organised for me, I didn't really have to do anything. Um, and this is where God used the fact that I had a mitral valve regurgitation to... Because if I didn't have that need, I would have never considered to go. Yeah, we got to the church and, um, you know, I didn't have like an antenna up for anything. Personally, I didn't really believe anything. I'd seen a lot of uh, staleness and, and um, sort of just ineffective Christianity really in my childhood. Um, I didn't have any expectation whatsoever. I was just there really for a bit of a laugh. Um, and just because someone else had paid for it. But when I got off the bus, you know, there was like a, just a, a nice, it was a nice atmosphere. It felt, even though you're kind of in the middle of Lagos and it's loud and noisy, the church was quite peaceful, I felt. Um, and, you know, so I was there for a few days and, and obviously they, they didn't allow smoking in the church. So at this point I was going through a pack of cigarettes a day and it, you know, three days was a long time probably the longest time in years I ha you know, I hadn't smoked. And so uh, this is where like the first kind of miraculous thing really in my life took place. Um, I went and got one of the junior pastors or whatever. I don't even remember whether it was a woman or a man or anything really. And I just said to him, look, I need a cigarette. So someone needs to sort me out, like finding one, please. And they said, uh, well, we don't smoke on church premises. So I said, look, if I was fairly blunt about it, I said, look, if you, if you don't find me a cigarette, I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna go and find one from someone in the street. And he goes, why don't I just pray for you? You don't need to smoke anymore. And I was like, all right, mate, fine. Yeah, let's, let's do that. And so I was thinking all the time, right, when this geezer's finished doing what he's doing, 
Maybe I'll go and speak to one of the guards. Maybe I'll see what I can do, just so I can get a cigarette. I don't even remember the prayer at all. It was probably a minute long. But all I, it's so mad. All I know that when he, when he stopped praying, I didn't need to smoke anymore. And, and so that was August 2007. And from that day to this, I've never had a cigarette since. Never smoked anything since, vapes or nothing. And um, it, like, it, it just went. And I didn't have, you know, I've spoken to people and they're like, well, maybe you're hypnotised and this and that. And I mean, you know, I didn't even know this bloke. I, I was not in agreement with what he was saying. I can't even remember what he was saying. All I know is after the prayer, I just didn't need to smoke again. Simple as that. And so after that, I thought, I went and sat down and I was like, right, this is, there's something going on here because this is very strange. Um, and so I started to kind of take notice of what was going on a little bit more in the, in the church. And it rolled around to the, to, the prayer, to the prayer line. If you haven't seen it before, it's interesting, to say the least. Uh, I mean, it was like the exorcist, mate. Like, there was people throwing up and screaming. And, like, and he, was coming down the, he was coming down the prayer line. Uh, TB Josh was coming down the prayer line. And I was like, man, I've been involved in all this madness. And these are like normal people, like bankers and like just normal people. And they're flapping around on the floor. What on earth is going to happen to me? And I sort of said to God, I was like, I really don't want to like flap around on the floor and like vomit over myself. Um, you know, and God's so gracious because he'll, he'll always meet you where you are. And he knew that I probably couldn't handle that at that point. So the prophet, he sort of come up to me and the way I describe it, uh, he put his hand on my shoulder. He didn't really, I don't think he even said anything, but how, how I kind of describe it is like, if you look at a, uh, you shouldn't look at them, but if you, if you ever see the end of a, a welder's, torch it's like a purple light basically I didn't see it but I kind of felt it in my chest um, and I just felt so clean man like it wasn't overwhelmingly powerful or anything like that necessarily but yeah I just felt this like spark in me and just just I just felt clean um, and and then he moved on and I thought well, I've had a touch there so I haven't rolled around or anything and uh, and something was different something was different and uh, I remember just going to bed that night and uh, I just slept like, I mean, it's probably the best sleep I've ever had in that place. Like it was just, it was just so peaceful. And I woke up in the morning and <clears throat> I remember from my youth trying to read the Bible, you know, and if you've ever been in Leviticus or Numbers or something like that, I mean, it's pretty hard going. And um, so I was just like reading the Bible like I was like devouring it, man. Like I was reading it and it was all making sense. It just felt like the Bible had sort of come alive really because... Um, Previous, pre prior to me having the actual real encounter with the living God, as it were, um, it had always been like dusty religion um, and it had always been faith on the coattails of mum. So when she was trying to read the Bible to me, um, it always kind of felt impersonal and not really relevant. Um, and just the chore to read, it was just, it was just difficult to read. Um, I mean, I remember reading Acts and I was like, what is this guy talking about? Um, and and the, the transformation in my thinking and how, because the Bible, I believe, the Bible can be read as a book or it can be read as the word of God. And the difference is people can read the Bible with their mind or you can read it with your heart. Um, and when you read it with your heart, that's when it has power. Um, and that's when it, it, becomes, it comes alive because the Bible, it's a, it's a mad way of saying it, but like, as you're reading the Bible, the Bible reads you, kind of thing. And uh, <clears throat> so that's basically what I find, found started to happen. I, uh, as I was reading the Bible, I was in Proverbs a lot, and I was like, man, this is making so much sense. Like, um, and it, was so, it felt so applicable to, to, to my life, whereas before it never really had. Um, so I come back. I got picked up from the airport by my dad, and he, he literally thought he'd picked up the wrong bloke at the airport because I went from you know uh, I, I was literally smoking a cigarette as I said goodbye to him no doubt um, and I come back I'd, I'd stop smoking um, through through no act of will on my own it just it just got taken um, and uh, I you know I, I used to swear every other word and um, again it wasn't like I had to try to stop swearing it just fell out of my vocabulary um, and and that's the transformation power of being with God. When you, when you spend time with him and when you're in the secret place with him, things as a natural consequence that are not of him can't stay in the light and they fall away. 
and uh, it's not you trying to be a better person. There's, there's a, a lot to be said of the difference between uh, personal improvement, which is a, a man-made thing, uh, uh, like a, a humanistic thing, and, and being transformed by God. The only thing you have to do for that, I feel, is you just have to press in to seek relationship and everything else comes as a byproduct of, of that relationship. Um, it's not biting your lip to be better. Uh, that's what I found anyway. So yeah, like just to quantify that, I, I got home, dad was perplexed, my friends were thinking I was, to you know, I mean, some of them thought it was amazing, some of them thought I was brainwashed or something, and um, I just didn't care, man. I, I was reading my Bible like all day. I, I was in a, it was summer when I got back and I was in a field uh, where I lived and I was just walking around praising God and reading the Bible and uh, shouting and being generally quite loud. And uh, the, the owner of the field come along, this quite aggressive bloke, and he sort of comes right up to me, what are you doing in my field? And uh, I sort of start walking towards him with obviously a kind of crazy looking grin on my face. And I was like, oh, I'm just reading my Bible, mate. I'm just praying, is that all right? And so he starts backing away and getting into his car. He's like, yeah, you can read your book, mate, no problem. Looking at me like I'm, I'm absolutely you know, lost or something. And, uh, and that was kind of how I found myself being in every, situ like every situation, every um, interaction I was having with people, I, I, could, I could see the connection. Like you could always bring God into the situation, whereas before I never realised, I never realised that that was like a thing. And it's amazing, and I know it's real, and it's brilliant, but um, you know, we have a part to play in this. It's not just, you know, I, I, I feel like sometimes people think, oh, say the sinner's prayer and then you're good to go, you're sweet for the rest of your life. It's, that's not actually how a relationship works. Like you have to, it's a day by day communion with God. It, it, the same as a relationship on earth, really, to be honest, in that respect. You, you have to maintain it, you have to, you know, you have a part to play. It's not, you, you're not just passive in the situation. It, it says in the Bible, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And um, I had had a real and tangible experience with the living God, you know, and uh, it radically transformed my life. However, there was there were still elements of the Christian walk that I didn't understand, and um, and one of those specifically was grace. So, <clears throat> what I found was I I was in this place where I didn't want to sin, I didn't want to you know um, do anything that grieved God's heart. But what I didn't understand was that His grace is sufficient. So I wasn't ever, I, I wasn't in conscious sin, but every time I had a thought where I felt like, um, you know, it was a sinful thought, or I did something that I felt displeased God, I'd sort of chastise myself, and I'd, I'd give uh, a certain amount of time to penance, I guess, um, to, to make myself feel better and feel that God had forgiven me. So if I say had a, a bad thought, I'd spend say half an hour apologising to God and, and as you can imagine you know you do that sort of five or six times in a day it can get pretty pretty boring and uh, and quite stressful um, I, I basically swapped my relationship for religion and that is a big problem in the church today people have swapped relationship for religion and this is why most people walk around like dry sticks because because they haven't got the reality they've just exchanged it for a list of do's and don'ts and let me tell you there is no power in a list of do's and don'ts and it is boring um, there is power and there is just an amazing life in a relationship with Jesus. And anything outside of that really is, is, um, is a, a pale representation. And so I basically exchanged the reality for a pale representation because of what I didn't understand. I didn't understand grace. What I found was, even though I had had this experience that totally transformed everything, um, I ended up falling back into the world. And it's mad to me to think now that even though I had the knowledge of the truth, I still managed to go back to that. And, you know, that's more common than people think. People have a real genuine experience of Jesus and they end up getting pulled away. And I've seen it countless times. Um, people, people have an amazing encounter and they don't maintain it or, you know, life comes and, and, and their, their walk with us. And uh, like it says in the Bible with... Um, uh, you know, when uh, your house is swept clean um, and then that thing comes back and brings seven of its friends basically and you're worse off than you were before. And I found that to be very true in my case. So prior to going to 
synagogue and, you know, and uh, having that experience, that encounter with Jesus, I was a drug user. Um, basically, when I fell away again, I became a drug dealer. And rather than just destroying my life and you know, those closest to me, I ended up wrecking the lives of hundreds of people, if not thousands, over the, over the course of time that I was involved with it. I, I, never, I never really took drugs again, but I, uh, I become like a money man. I wanted to, I wanted to have, I wanted to have finance basically. Um, but I was earning, you know, three, four, five thousand pound a week, um, and you know, for like a 21, 22 year old kid, that's quite a bit of change. I knew God was. I still knew God was real. I'd read Psalm 91 before I went to bed, like trying to protect me or something. And uh, y- you know, so I kind of knew the reality of God, and yet I was in this lifestyle. And so the, I had a. a my sense of right and wrong and, and the truth and the lie was just warring within me all the time. And, you know, I was, never, I was never down, but I was always angry. I never had peace. Um, you know, I'd go on lovely holidays. I'd ha- I had a nice uh, little sports car thing and, and you know, everything you could kind of want from a materialistic point of view. And yet I was, I was frustrated, uh, angry and unfulfilled. I, unfuf- like the sense of unfulfillment I had was all-encompassing really because I, I knew what I'd had and lost and um, and yet I was pursuing this life of darkness um, that lifestyle makes you a nasty person because you're dealing with people who are trying to cheat you you, you know I had people come to my house to try and rob me uh, you know I nearly got hit in the head with a crowbar in, outside my own house you know I had to uh, we had, there was a big fight outside my house um, people trying to uh, you know take advantage and uh, so you have to become more aggressive than the people who are also in that environment. And um, you can't compartmentalize your life either. So, you know, that bleeds out into every aspect. So you're aggressive with your family members, you're aggressive with your mum and dad and, and girlfriend. And because you're sneaky in, in one area with the drugs, it just bleeds into every area of your life and just makes you generally a nasty person. So yeah, so this, uh, this was me uh, in the midst of all of that. Uh, obviously not looking very happy. Uh, I was extremely volatile um, and, and to be honest with you because I was never like really the biggest uh, chap or anything I, I had to overcompensate with that by just being hyper aggressive um, so you know I would uh, I would let people run up a, a tick list basically of, of money they owed me and then if they didn't owe me I'd just I'd just run up into the house kick the door in um, and ju- just things like that uh, where I just used to go above and beyond to just prove that you, you kind of couldn't take advantage. I was incredibly angry all the time. Like I remember, and it's such a foreign, it's such a foreign feeling to me now, but I used to wake up angry. Like I didn't even know that was possible. Like I'd wake up in a, in a, in a rage. I think um, the, the main feeling I felt throughout all of this was just a sense of unfulfillment because I knew the truth and I knew God had all these promises for me and all this stuff for me to do and how and how that is the ultimate expression of life, doing what God wants you to do. And that's where you find true joy, peace, you know, and, and all the rest of it. And yet I'd basically sold my birthright, you know, for effectively nothing really. And yet it, there was an element of enjoyment in those things. And yet it actually didn't, it wasn't comparable to how I was feeling. Like I, I felt unfulfilled, frustrated and angry probably most of the time. And I think, you know, one of the things that, um, especially in today's society, you know, there's this like kind of uh, glamour around this street life, you know, and um, it's really not like that. The, the death, the despair, the destruction that goes with this lifestyle is never really talked about or shown in these films, these gangster films and all of this. Like, you know, I've got, um, I, I had a friend, uh, We'll call him Dan. He uh, he he tried heroin twice, and the second time he overdosed, and he he died in a uh, a pool of his own vomit in his flat in London, and uh, no one found him for like 20 hours. Um, uh, I've got another friend of mine. He's serving an eight-year stretch in jail for conspiracy to uh, supply Class A. You know, I know guys who are doing who are doing 20 20 years. There's there's a lot there's a lot to be said about the the pain and the despair behind, um, you know, uh, this lifestyle, and it's very self-centered. Um, case in point, actually, uh, one of the things that sticks out in my mind uh, from from those days was there was a 
There was a guy who used to, he was a gas engineer and he had quite a lot of money, still lived at home. He started off by buying just like a gram of, of Charlie, a gram of cocaine a week. And that slowly progressed. I watched his habit grow, much to my, you know, I was happy about that because I was earning more money out of him. Um, so it started as a gram, uh, like on a Friday night. And then it was a Friday and a Saturday. Then it was a Friday, a Saturday and a Sunday. And then he started buying an eight ball, which is uh, 3.5 grams of, of whatever, basically. He was buying one of those a day, seven days a week uh, for months. Suddenly he just stopped answering his phone. And uh, <clears throat> I let it slide for a couple of weeks. And, uh, and then basically I started ringing his, his number, getting quite irate about it. And uh, his, eventually his mum answered the phone. And uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's crazy to me now how callous I was. She answered the phone and said, uh, I'll call him James. He, J James is... James has basically had a psychotic episode, drug-induced psychotic episode, and he's in the, uh, the local mental hospital. Uh, and uh, I said, what's that got to do with me? He owes me, he owes me X amount of money, someone needs to pay it. I said this to the mother of the child who, through my actions, had been put in a mental hospital. And I, I did not care. That just goes to show the level of hard-heartedness that I'd arrived at without even really trying. It was just because of the lifestyle. So this sort of carried on in, in a similar vein for a while um, and it got to the point where obviously mum bless her, you know, she, she had been over the moon when I found, you know, when Jesus found me um, and then I turned my back on him, got worse than I was before so obviously she was a bit upset about it. I was always upfront and honest with mum um, and uh, we, we started getting a little bit too in your face with things and we ended up getting raided by the police. I think my brother woke up to, uh, I think it was three or four firearms, uh, police officers around his bed. Um, he, got, he got taken to the local, uh, the local jail. So mum had a dream at this time and she said, I feel like, I, well I've had a dream, fear's behind barbed wire, but you're, it was like uh, you were on a motorbike and it was like the great escape and you jumped over the barbed wire and like drove off. And I said, listen, either we're both going down or neither of us is going to. Um, and uh, not a couple of weeks after that, I had a call from the, I think it was the lady who was in charge of the investigation or my lawyer or someone. And basically they said, look, we're dropping the case against you be because of insufficient evidence. And to this day, I, I don't understand how that happened because my fingerprints must have been on all the scales, the bags and everything else. Uh, there was no text correspondence linking me to... Uh, to anything in the property but there was for Theo and basically it was a text message linking him using his name to his phone that ended up uh, being the catalyst that got him the conviction. He ended up going up in court uh, and the judge presiding over his case was uh, <laughs> happened to actually specifically like detest drug dealers and he said to Theo in no uncertain terms you're a menace to society um, and uh, he gave him 11 months. That's him getting out of HMP Reading and uh, he got 11 months and he did three and a half on good behaviour and then he got out on, on tag, on an electronic tag and during this time while he was in prison he, he sort of found God in a big way because uh, he really had nothing else and so he come out of the lifestyle um, and I was still in it and we were living together so it was quite a, quite a sort of fractious time really for both of us. Prior to that uh, just another example of God's goodness, even in the midst of me turning my back on him. Uh, he, uh, there was a, a time we had to go and we had a customer uh, who wanted something and uh, Fear was going to go and dr drop it off to him. And uh, Fear said, do you want to come along for the drive? And I was getting my shoes on ready to go. And uh, without over-spiritualising it, I basically, uh, I just kind of had a sense, don't go. Just, there's no point in you going. So I sort of said, Theo, do you know what? I actually can't be bothered. I'll see you, I'll see you when you get back. And, and not half an hour later, uh, he, he get, I get a phone call off him. And uh, he says, I've, I've written off the car. I've hit a telephone pole. This was the car. Um, and this was the passenger side uh, door. So basically where the, where the passenger, like the pillion of the, of the door was, it had been crushed in and it was right next to Theo's head. So... The police, the, the, the copper at the scene, he said, uh, you know, if someone had been in the passenger seat, you know, they probably wouldn't, wouldn't have survived that. Um, 
so that's just another sort of example of, of God's goodness to me, even, even in the midst of my disobedience. So I, I was carrying on with all this stuff, running on, knowing the truth, rejecting the truth, and, and like those two uh, kind of moral frameworks were just basically bashing heads with me in me all the time so it was very difficult for me you know I was always frustrated always angry just because I I knew what I should be doing and what I should be pursuing because it's right and true and real and yet I was turning my back on it it, it was actually looking back like an addiction because for me an addiction is something that you are compelled to do and you don't want to do it and I was actually reaching the point where I didn't want to be in that lifestyle but I couldn't really see a way out of it to be honest um, I was used to the money I was used to the influence it gave and, and all the rest of it. At this point, I met uh, a guy uh, who was a pastor. He used to be an ex-heroin and crack dealer. What I liked about going to his place was it was, there was no condescension. I never got any condescension from him or anyone in the, in the church. A lot of people in the church, I mean, it was like something out of the Book of Acts or something. There was like prostitutes in there and flipping, you know, like drug dealers and, and just like what people would consider like scummy people I guess you know and they were all we were all there me included we were all there you know because we we had tasted a tangible reality of God and we wanted to change and I think the issue I found a lot of whenever I was dragged to church maybe with mum or whatever in the sort of in the years this was all going on oftentimes I felt um, you know an air of condescension um, and you know just to say if anyone is in the church environment if you're a leader in the church or even if you're just you know going to a church and someone from a, a background that you don't agree with whatever that may be and there's plenty of them um, attends the church don't look down your nose at them don't uh, don't look at them out the corner of your eye treat them how Jesus would treat them because that's effectively Christians is little Christ like one we're men to emulate Jesus we're men are we're men to be his hands and feet and <clears throat> if you've got someone coming in the church who's coming in for a legitimate reason because they want, they want hope and you're giving them a, a, you know, like a sly glance or, or you know, uh, looking down on them, it's not conducive to them and their walk. And I know this from personal experience because actually I got quite angry with the church in general because I just, it just felt like, you know, and some of those people, some of those very people who are looking down their nose at me, I knew that their kids were involved in exactly the same stuff that I was involved with and so there was an element of hypocrisy in that as well. Um, we just need to be like Jesus. We need to show people love. It doesn't mean that we accept them like for where they are to stay there. It means that we give them the grace to come as they are and then enable them to change in an environment that's you know loving, basically. Um, and so <clears throat> that's, uh, that's what I found at this church. I mean, the, hip the hypocrisy in my life at this point is just astronomical so I'd be in church here I am I know God's real you know we'd be we'd be in, in the middle of worship and you know one of my customers would be texting me like oh yeah I'm out the back mate and I'd be like right give me like 10 minutes and I'll, I'll be out so I, I'd be in worship you know giving it Jesus or whatever and then we go out around the back and I'm serving serving people up you know with whatever they're after so I was in this like this parallel universe really I was trying to get back to God and at the same time this this lifestyle had this hold on me um, and, and it got to the point where the war within me was so great. I was, I was getting pretty, I was just, fra I felt frazzled all the time because I knew the truth and I was in this lifestyle and I knew they were incompatible. I, I basically was getting to the point where I knew that I had to make a choice, one or the other. I couldn't continue in the same vein because it was just making me so, so um, frustrated and angry really. And um, around this time, you know, God's so good. Uh, I just felt like I needed a bit of a kick in the right direction, really. So I, I, it was quite out of the blue. I had a dream. I was outside a particular shop in my town and there was a guy in a car. I mean, I remember all the details so clearly. He was saying to me, oh, you've done something. You've done X, Y, and Z to my son. You like, I don't know, beat him up or something or, or whatever else. And as I leant into the car to have, have an altercation with him, my phone fell into his car and he quickly slammed the door and drove off. And as he drove off, I woke up and yeah, I can only really describe this feeling that come over me as like abject terror. I've never felt anything like it before. And 
my analytical brain, I was like, why am I feeling like this? Like, I was trying to ration, like, that's not a nightmare, that was just like a normal dream. Like, th this thing totally broadsided me, come out of the blue, and, and quite frankly, I had no grid for it, for how to process it, really. It was so, such an all-encompassing feeling that I felt like I almost couldn't function, really, because it was just so heavy. And so I'm ringing mum, she's praying for me, nothing's happening. And isn't it funny that, you know, when suddenly something bad happens, we're like, oh, you know, and we run back to God then, but like, you know, Mr. Big Bad drug dealer, until something bad happens, and then you're ringing your mum, trying to get her to pray for you, and that, which I find quite funny now. But, so I'm ringing mum, she's praying, nothing's happening, ringing my pastor, he's praying, nothing's happening, I'm like, what on earth am I going to do? It quietened down towards the end of the day a bit, but it was still in the background, and then I, I fell asleep, and the same thing happened. So, um, total terror. I remember going downstairs and looking in the mirror in the bathroom, and I couldn't even, it's the weirdest thing, I couldn't even see my eyes, it was like black holes. And it was, it was awful, man. It was, it was just, it was terrible. And I didn't know how, it was very, it, it felt very hopeless. And uh, even though it wasn't, you know, it was only two days, but it was, it was awful. And so <clears throat> in the gym, uh, we had a, like an upper room where we used to let the church pray. Um, and so I went up there not really knowing what to do. and. Uh, one of my brothers in the Lord, this guy called Marky, um, he, he started, real man of God, man, and he starts praying for me. And uh, he's got his hand on my chest, can't remember what he's saying, he's praying, he's praying, and, and suddenly I feel like I just want to like run out of the room. Um, like there's this thing in me saying, run, run, run. And I'm like, I ain't going nowhere, I'm standing right here. And uh, yeah, literally, as he's praying, this thing just stops. Like, literally like turning the tap off. I didn't have to, you know, sometimes if you're, fearful or you've got anxiety about something or a situation you can kind of think well actually it's not that bad because x y and z it wasn't like that it just stopped there was no rationalizing it it just you know and i was literally like on my face thanking god man because it was like chalk and cheese i just went from feeling like this to feeling peace and it was amazing and uh i thought i'm gonna switch my phone off for a couple of days and you know not you know do any of the activities i was getting involved with because i sort of wanted to thank God or something by not, you know, being a drug dealer for a couple of days and it's weird thinking, man. But, um, and then I turned my phone back on, obviously, and sort of just carried on, even though I'd had this horrible experience. I mean, even talking about it now, I can kind of feel the, like, the kind of the residual feeling of how that felt because it was, it was such a poignant thing. I was carrying on this lifestyle and then basically um, I had a dream uh, and I was, in a, I was in a prison cell and I was sitting in the middle of the jail cell and the door opened up and I didn't see who had opened it but in the dream I knew it was Jesus and I stood up, walked out of the, walked out of the jail cell, picked up, they give you these like little microwave trays of food. I picked it up and I went and sat back on the chair in the middle of the, the cell and just carried on eating my food and I woke up <clears throat> and I, it was just so clear, I just knew, Jesus was like, look, I'm giving you an avenue out of this. I feel like the dreams that I had where that terror was, it was almost like God was showing me, this, this is your life without my protection. This is your life without me holding back what you deserve. You know, I mean, that's powerful, bro. Like, even in the, this is how much God loves us. Like, we spit in his face, I spat in his face, after knowing the truth and him setting me free from all manner of stuff, and then I literally turn around and start destroying the very people who are created in his image, turn my back on him, turn my back on my, my created destiny and my purpose, waste 10 years uh, of, of time that could have been spent you know, in, in his service or in, in relationship with him, I probably should say. And yet he still was so gracious to me. Um, you know, and the thought blows me away now thinking about it because... It's just, you know, his grace and his mercy know no bounds. And yet, like, people seem to think that's a license to sin. Um, and it's, it's really not. It's just not a license to sin. It's, it's, it's a gift that we should, we should recognise and appreciate and, and actually act on. So basically, I acted on it. I, I thought, OK, that dream's absolutely clear. I certainly don't want to be like that. Um, no money or power or uh, lifestyle is worth that feeling. You know, feeling how I was in those other dreams. And uh, so I literally, 
I just stopped, I rang up the guy who I was buying my sort of bigger amounts of stuff off and I said, look, I'm getting out of the, getting out of the game really. And, um, and, and within the space of like a day or two, I just wound everything down. Um, and then I got a job on a building site and I was earning, I was bumping tiles for a roofer and it was, it was hot and it was, you know, I wasn't really used to working too hard. I trained at the gym, but that was like for a couple of hours a, a day, you know, once or twice a day or whatever. And uh, so this was like eight hours of hard graft for £70 a day. And, uh, you know, the devil man was just in my ear every single day like, you're a mug. You could earn £1,000 from a phone conversation, from a phone call. You could earn grand and, and here you are climbing up and down ladders on roofs and that for £70. Um, and, and to be honest with you, um, it was harder. I feel like I was more tempted to go back to the lifestyle like the drug dealing lifestyle than I was ever for to smoke again. Um, and so, you know, that took quite a few months really to kind of unpick all of that. And eventually I, I started to uh, sort of come out of the, uh, out of that uh, kind of mindset, um, really just by renewing my mind. So um, around the end of 2014, early 2015, um, a lady, a girl started training at my gym called Cara. And uh, she ended up becoming my wife. Basically, I've got a photo actually. So, picture of a thousand words. That's my family. So this this is a testament. Uh, <coughs> this is a testimony, a test, yeah, a testimony of God's goodness in my life. Um, I've got two two amazing boys. Sorry, because <coughs> God's so good. Because you know, I wouldn't ha I wouldn't have had any of this. Uh, if I'd have stayed in that lifestyle, I probably wouldn't even be here, really. So I don't want to be, I don't like it when people get emotional in these videos, cause I, don't, I don't know. But basically, you know, when I look at this, I just, I just see God's goodness. And uh, we've, actually, we've actually got a third boy on the way uh, due February. So, you know, God's truly blessed me, uh, even though I didn't deserve it, you know. And actually, I do want to just say one other thing. Um, so... If people were going to, and this is, a, you know, God's blessed me with a family. He's blessed me with a business. You know, I, I've got a building company and, and uh, he's blessed us financially and, and, and with health and things like that. But I've seen a lot of people come to God for what they can get rather than for them to be transformed. We're here to be transformed into his likeness. We're not here for him to be a genie in a bottle, you know, and give me a nice house, give me a car, give me a wife, give me kids. Those things are fine, but if you're coming to Christ for those things, I'm here to tell you, you're going to probably be disappointed because that's not what it's about. It's about relationship. And also, you know, we're never, we're never promised uh, clear skies and glassy seas. Um, it says that Jesus said himself, in this life you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So just to use my own personal experience, um, for the last two Two years since March 2021, my brother, um, who's, who's a Christian, he's got five kids, um, he, he started to have trouble speaking and swallowing. And uh, basically, we've been to uh, like uh, really quite high up neurologists in London and things like this. And um, he's had EMGs, uh, CT scans, everything. And they, they have no idea what's wrong with him, basically. Let me tell you, you better have a faith and not a theology when, when the rough times in life come. If you've got a list of do's and don'ts, if you've got a theological framework that you're kind of basing your life on, but there's no reality behind it, I'm telling you now, when something like that happens, you'll absolutely be totally shipwrecked. And you'll be like, why is God doing this to me? God doesn't give people, God doesn't give people sickness. God doesn't, he, he's not in the killing, stealing and destruction business. Um, People really need to stop being mad at God for stuff, man. Like, it's just, it's so important. And uh, not once, even with all this stuff going on, have I ever, or my mum or Theo or anyone, we've never been angry at God. Uh, we've always understood that trials happen in life. Like, I used to think I was, I used to think probably quite erroneously that I was like a tough guy. I used to think I was, you know, whatever. But this year, really, all I realised was is actually I've had a very easy life. I've never really had to deal with any trials or trauma yeah okay I was involved with drugs and things like this but that was all of my own choice I've never had anything thrust on me 
where I've actually had to discover how deep my faith actually is and how I'm going to respond to these situations. And let me tell you, it's been eye-opening. And that's the journey I'm on currently. Um, and, you know, thank God I found my faith. And that's not to say that I haven't had days where sleepless nights and days wondering what's going on, but God's teaching me not to trust in the arm of flesh and to just trust him. And uh, so, you know, that, the, the year's been tough, but actually the year's been a blessing because it's shown me that my faith is being refined. Just to finish, um, you know, if there's anyone who's watching this who is maybe enticed by that lifestyle, don't waste your time. Don't waste your time because all that it will lead to is, is death and despair, man. Yeah, you might have money, you might have some influence, but it's, it's not worth your peace. And, you know, thank God that he saved me before, I don't want to get all like, chatting about heaven and hell and all this, but we need to think of, an etern we need to, we need to think of the eternal consequence of our actions. And, you know, for some of my friends, it's too late for them to, to change that. Their, their course has already been decided and they're in eternity now. And, um, <clears throat> and that's, that's that on, you know, for, for them. Um, so I would say as well, if there's any parents watching and your kids are going through stuff or they're, they're being enticed, you know, by the world, watch their friend group and stay. It's a tightrope you have to walk as a parent, I feel. And mum did this quite well. She didn't, she never, never write your kids off. Never write your kids off if they're going through stuff. But then you've got to walk the tightrope of not enabling their behaviour. It's a very fine line, but it is possible because I've experienced it myself. Um, and uh, don't stop praying. Never stop praying for your kids, man. I wouldn't even, we wouldn't even be having this conversation if, if, if mum had just said, oh, do you know what, this is too, this, you know, a year in, well, nothing's changed, I'm just, you know, I'll wash my hands with him. I, I'd, be, I'd be a crackhead, dead, you know, or crackhead or in, in jail or dead, probably. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's a testimony to, uh, to God's grace in my life. But we have a part to play. You know, this is why we need to pray. God's not like a puppet master, you know, like we're all marionettes just dancing to his tune. This is the reason why he tells us to pray, because actually our prayers change situations. What my whole story is kind of pointing towards is a couple of things. First of all, it's, it's God's unmerited grace and favour. Like, he, he's predestined us before the formation of the world, man. Like, like we're valuable to God. He's not, he's not like some geezer with a beard on a cloud far away. He's so intimate and personal um, to, to each individual. Um, you know, he, he would have died on the cross for us, even if it was just one person on earth. Like, that's how, that's how personal this relationship can be. But we have a part to play, and that's over my whole life, if I, if I look back and kind of... Actually, the main theme, really, is when I fell away or when things started to go wrong in the relationship I had with God, it was never him, it was always what I was doing or not doing. And that's not a works thing, by the way. It's just, it's, do you know what? The gospel message is so simple, fishermen could understand it. Yeah, like, children can get it. It's, it's not hard, like, we, we press into God, we spend time with him, we're conformed to his image, and it's literally as simple as that. And then the things of the world fall away, we don't need to try and change, bite our lip to do better. And, you know, it says in the Bible, if you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. And, and I, I feel like sometimes people, people forget that all your heart bit. Listen, like, if you had a wife, you wouldn't boast to your friends that you spend 10 minutes in the morning. Like, I spent 10 minutes with my wife this morning. Like, I had a conversation with my wife this morning. Like, but people, people say, oh, I had 15 minutes Bible time with, with God this morning. Like, it's a, like, that's a good thing. But if we're to treat Jesus as the predominant and most important relationship in our life, 15 minutes reading a Bible scripture isn't really going to cut the mustard, to be honest with you. I'm just talking from personal experience. You have to have that intimate time. You have to put... I can't remember the, the preacher who said it, but he said about like, not having enough time, so he needed to spend an extra hour of time in prayer. Like, that's how important uh, we, should, we should place our time, our, our alone time with God. It needs to take... Um, superiority over everything else and when we seek him with all our heart that's when we'll see that our lives are starting to change and that's that's taken me like 12 years to figure that out 
like don't waste that like take on board what i'm saying you know and if it's if it's been helpful for you and and just realize that like we have a part to play but all our part to play is, is just seeking god and just being close with him and spending time with him and then everything else starts to happen as a result of that um, and i would encourage as well you know like i feel a real affinity to this ministry and to the to the guys running it um and uh, I, I would I would seriously encourage watch some of the videos, um, you know, that are already on the on the platform. Um, there's there's interactive prayer. There's all sorts of things, you know. And uh, the great thing about God's Heart TV is the fact that it's not just words; it's words with power. And that's the fundamental difference between a relationship with Jesus and a religion. So, yeah. I hope I hope it's uh, I hope this has blessed someone. Even if it's just one person. Look, I come down, I drove three and a half hours at five in the morning to get here. I'm not getting paid for this, yeah. I spent 150 quids worth of fuel to get here because I care passionately about what I'm saying. This is real. And even if it just helps like one person, I'll, I'll consider I'll consider that a win, you know. Um, so yeah, God bless. <laughs>